Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Good afternoon. Welcome to the session on uh, Zimbabwe at the Council on Foreign Relations. My first assignment is to ask you, beg you, in fact, to turn off your electronic devices. I'm told you can't just put them on vibrate because they'll interfere with the sound system. Uh, second announcement, uh, this, is a, <coughs> this session is on the record, so whatever you say can be used, however it court should wall. be. <laughs> I'm going to start with a couple of comments about Zimbabwe, then introduce our panelists and jump right in. I think many of you know that Zimbabwe's independence occurred 29 years ago tomorrow, and it offered a significant source of hope throughout the region, throughout the continent, but particularly in Southern Africa, where apartheid seemed invincible and South Africa's occupation of Namibia appeared to be a, a, a long-term uh, situation. As an eyewitness, I experienced the sense of excitement and expectation that day in 1980 as Salisbury became Harare, the Union Jack was lowered and Rhodesia transformed into Zimbabwe, but the country's recent history has seen a reversal of hopes as the regime headed by the former liberation hero Robert Mugabe has become a symbol of African authoritarianism and despair. In February, almost a year after disputed elections that most people believe were won by the opposition movement for democratic change, a unity government was formed with the movement's uh, Morgan Sangurai as prime minister, but with Mugabe still holding key power centers, including defense and home affairs ministries. Today, Zimbabwe has a fragile coalition government, a collapsed economy and a ruined infrastructure, and a severe cholera epidemic. In today's session, we will examine Zimbabwe's prospects, the current political impasse, and the role that the international community, and the United States in particular, can and should play now and in the future. The two <coughs> distinguished diplomats beside me need no introduction to those of you who follow Africa. You have bios for both of them. I'm not going to repeat them. Let me just say that Walter Kansteiner, beside me, held the senior Africa policy post, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, from, 19, from 2001 to 2004, serving under Secretary of State Colin Powell and President George W. Bush. He's currently a senior fellow at the Forum for International Policy and a founding principal at the Scowcroft Group. Tom McDonald was U.S. Ambassador to Zimbabwe from 1997 to 2001 under President Clinton and currently is a partner at Baker Hostetler. So I'm going to begin by asking each of you to reflect on the current situation and specifically on Zimbabwe's prospects, short term and over a longer frame. The country's economy has been in free fall with inflation soaring, productivity plummeting. Life expectancy now estimated in the mid 30s may be the lowest in the world, but Zimbabwe has experienced neither the severity of devastation that armed warfare has brought to countries like Liberia, nor decades of stagnation that have, have been experienced in places like Guinea. So my first question is, how rapidly do you think Zimbabwe might be able to recover once stability is established, and what do you see as a likelihood of a turnaround in Zimbabwe? You want to start, Walter? Be happy to. Thank you, Reid. And thank you for all the hard work you guys do on Africa Online. It's a thank great you. resource for all of us. Thank you. Um, and, and I share your, your uh, feelings about Zimbabwe as one of those places of great hope and inspiration, not, not only 25, 35 years ago, but today, too, in the sense that it is an incredible country that has human resources, it has natural resources, um, it just unfortunately has terrible uh, management. And it, it is when that management, in fact, is, is transformed that that potential um, will, will come alive again. I think your question on how long will it take for that country to come alive again um, 
is one that the developmentalists, those that are actually looking at how economic development um, can uh, occur uh, in Zimbabwe and how quickly it can occur, is, is a question that policymakers are starting to really wrestle with now, too. Um, Michelle Gavin, who's now at the National Security Council, wrote an interesting piece for the Council on, on exactly how can you plan for um, the revival of Zimbabwe and what should we all be doing. Uh, and I think it's a very good piece to kind of to look at and to start with. Um, no matter what, the economy will take some quarters, if it's five quarters or ten quarters, it will take a, you know, it will take some time to actually um, become really stabilized. Uh, when you have that hyperinflation for so many years and you have the degradation of the workforce and the unemployment rate so high, um, it is going to, it's just simply going to take a couple years to, to, to get it stable. Now, um, they've already made some interesting decisions, uh, this coalition government, one being essentially removing the Zimbabwe dollar. Mm -hmm. The Zimbabwe dollar does not exist as a currency today. Uh, it is all rand and dollar-based economy. Good start. That's actually, you know, that, that's actually going to kind of put a floor to it. And, um, and begin the building of it. But the short answer is it's going to take quite a few quarters before we really see any kind of revival in the economy. Well, um, let me pose the issue a little bit different than, than it's been put forward. Um, first of all, I think the, the question, uh, we're getting the cart before the horse a little bit here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the sense that until the political realities on the ground change and until we figure out whether this coalition uh, power sharing uh, is real um, and I'm certainly pleased to see uh, people like Tendai Beatty as the finance minister that I'm sure we're all happy about who's one of the real heroes of all this um, but until we see whether that's actually going to work or not, um, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves as to when we talk about development and how many quarters. Um, the other point I would make is that yes, while uh, Zimbabwe did not go through um, this sort of armed conflict, um, you know, bearing down on civilization there to its destruction as we saw in Liberia and this isn't Sierra Leone with Fodi Sanker uh, and his thugs cutting off um, limbs and, and wrists and hands. Um, this is a pretty evil regime <clears throat> that still exists. And, um, you know, I have often described Mugabe as, you know, very smart and very evil. And he has fewer cards to play now, but he still has some, and he's the consummate survivor. And, um, we, uh, we are certainly hopeful that the power sharing will become real power sharing, but the farm invasions continue. Those that were started when I was ambassador there and we saw the, the force marching and the chanting overnight and the rapes and the beatings um, in the um, Chinoy, Bankit, uh, Bandura areas north of uh, Harare that interestingly enough were in the center of the liberation struggle in the 60s and 70s. And we had Roy Bennett, <clears throat> who's a dear friend of many of us in the room. I actually had a chance to speak to his um, wife when I was in um, Johannesburg about six weeks ago and Roy was still in custody. He's a former MP from uh, Chimani Mani uh, out um, in the east of uh, Zimbabwe, but has always been a thorn in the government side and he came into Harare with assurances that he would be uh, sworn as a deputy agriculture minister under the new government. And he was promptly arrested and thrown <coughs> in a vehicle um, that was owned by um, one General um, Chawinga, who's head of the, still head of the military there and one of the architects of the very violent crackdown between, um, particularly after the first set of elections last year. And Chawinga's thugs, um, took Roy out east and put him in jail in Matari. And finally, after even they threatened to throw uh, the magistrate who was going to put him out on bail, they finally let him out. And so 
while <clears throat> this isn't like some places in Africa where the, where the devastation is overwhelming, the numbers of dead are e extraordinary. Mugabe um, long ago perfected the, the method of sort of killings and abuse and what I would call onesie twosies that somehow gets under the radar screen. And, and so, but having said all of that, um, uh, I would say on the, on the plus side of things, um, Zimbabwe has um, a great cachet. Uh, it is a wonderful country uh, with people that I came to love and respect. And uh, the Shonen Intabelli people will come back with a proper government. And I will certainly look to people like Tendai Bibi as to whether, in fact, um, this transition is working. Uh, I know that they did pay civil servants in February with money from South Africa. I noted today that Botswanans had promised a $70 million, I guess, line of credit. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to have to be very careful going forward because, um, ladies and gentlemen, if I had $10 every time someone told me um, the end is in sight uh, for the evil rule of Robert Mugabe, uh, my 201K would, would still be a 401K. <laughs> and um, we would be in a much better place than we are now. And so um, uh, let, let us first figure out is the power sharing working? When uh, will Mugabe actually exit? And what are people like, you know, David Coulthard, the education minister, I have a lot of respect for, and Tendai Bibi, the finance minister, telling us about, you know, is this working or not? And then we can figure out how we get the economy in order and how we move forward. But to stay on your point a minute, Tom, the, 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 say a little bit more about the process, what do you think it will take to make this uh, transition work? What it will it take to loosen Mugabe's hold? And isn't, as you point out, it's not just President Mugabe, it's General Chiwinga and other cronies that have a vested interest in the, Thugs, in, right. in the current situation and have a lot to lose uh, potentially in, in, right. a, in a changeover. So sure. what, what's going to shift the balance there? Sure. Well, I, I would direct our audience you know, you could probably find this on the internet over the weekend, the, the, something that's of great interest. There was a resolution that the, was up before the UN last July that unfortunately the Chinese and the Russians vetoed, but several African countries, including Burkina Faso, um, supported. But in, in any event, uh, there is a, a resolution annex that has like 13 names. And it's a real rogues gallery of, of characters around him, um, most of whom I had extensive dealings with. And, and it's a pretty vile group <clears throat> in terms of where they're coming from. And so when you talk about, you know, Comrade Mugabe going, you're also talking about what are these people going to do? What, what, is the, what are the Patrick Chinamasas, the Emerson Menengaguas, the Demius Mutasas of the world going to do when they don't have the... the largesse or whatever few crumbs are left there to live off of and the corruption that came from that. But these, um, these are bad people. And so the, the question becomes, well, there's really two things going on here uh, contemporaneously. On the one hand, you have, um, I think, hand-to-hand, -hand, almost literally hand-to-hand -hand combat, as it's been described to me, within some of these ministries where they have joint control, or even Mugabe. The other day, he announced uh, my old interlocutor, Nicholas Goche, who had been the deputy foreign minister. They put him over the telecom area, which is a huge thing with cell phones. All of us who go to Africa, there are so few fixed landlines. Cell phone control is so important. So, so he yanked that away from the MDC minister, gave it to his crony, Goche, who was, is a former CIO intelligence officer, had been in the foreign ministry, did different things. So we, we have to figure out, so there's this struggle going on within these ministries. How does that sort itself out? The South Africans, to their credit, came in with some money to pay civil servants. Coltart, to his credit, got the teachers back on the job. This was a country with the highest literacy rate in Africa when I was there, had a model education system. So there's that level of struggle within these ministries. There then is a second set of issues around, you know, what, what is, um, is going to happen to the defense ministry and the other um, <coughs> organs, the other apparati, apparatus of 
the government that controls the police and the military that is still within Mugabe's power, and is he going to give that up, and is Shangri going to, who, who you know, obviously has his own warts, but is, is, has been a hero, has been courageous in my view, stood up to torture against himself, but is he going to be able to stop the farm invasions to enforce the SATA court arbitration that found against them to sort things out, and the, and the, jury, the jury is out on that. Well, let's uh, look a minute at the, the role of the international community and the question of sanctions, which are still in force against Zimbabwe. What should be done about sanctions? What should be done about economic and humanitarian assistance, which is clearly thoroughly needed? Can, there, can the assistance begin to flow without undermining the process? Uh, you want to take that first? And it goes back to, to Tom's point about you, we've got to get a a feel for where the politics are before you start seeing serious money flow. Now, humanitarian assistance and um, particularly food aid and HIV AIDS, and that continues to go, and, and there is, I think, international consensus that, that is the, that's the right thing to do. On serious ministry budget support, um, I believe, I believe the, the, the point that Tom was making is, you know, you give them uh, significant capital to rebuild. What are your guarantees that that capital is actually going to to what you want it to go to? What are the guarantees that the teachers are going to get um, this this development assistance, rather than going into Mugabe's security apparatus? Um, and those are th those are the fine tuning points that I think this administration and and all governments around the world are wrestling with now. You know, how do you Guarantee that that the, the the money investment that you're making is actually going to what it should, and and number two, I think there should be an overarching um, notion that whatever that investment is should be given with an effort to diminish whatever power Mugabe has, um, and if you if you kind of approach it that way, um, I'll make this investment uh, as a company or as a country or whatever. If it diminishes his p overall power and has certain guarantees and milestones to know that it's actually being spent in the proper way. Tom, does this mean that money going in now should only be going in through NGOs and those kind of aid groups and not, not going to the government? Yes, I mean, I, I, it, you know, uh, yes. Um, we, we need to be very careful. Um, Mugabe is increasingly boxed in, has fewer cards to play, but still has some cards to play and, and is a very you know, uh, clever, clever person, as we have said. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, although I think, uh, and and well, this needs to be both joint African uh, and the international community. This is an African issue that ultimately the Africans need to sort out. And I, I'm pleased to see um, them stepping up with some money and some support. And SADC, I mean, I think SADC, if you know behind closed doors would say they're fed up with Mugabe and you know want him want him out but I think that any um, direct aid to the government it's it's premature to do that and um, you know the the question of getting teachers back in the classroom and given give, uh, getting civil servants and in my experience there in the three years I was there uh, there were some really quality people getting them on the job in a non-political way but I think that um, we need to review and verify that this is working and that you have, you know, again, on the one hand, this hand-to-hand -hand combat within ministries. On the other hand, you have the hardliners that are outlined in this UN resolution continuing to undermine the MDC. Uh, dissidents are still in jail. MDC people are still in jail. Uh, they still haven't sworn in Roy Bennett as the deputy agriculture minister. And so it's, uh, it's the typical Mugabe, uh, what I would call kind of rope-a-dope of, you know, let's run this play, and if that doesn't work, we'll run another play. I mean, just, just as an aside, um, every year I was there, they would have an extraordinary congress of the ZANU-PF party. And every year, um, and Earl Irving's in the crowd, who was our DCM out there, did just an extraordinary job. But 
they, they would come around and say, oh, the old man is going to go. You know, we've got the goods on him now. We're going to make some changes. And every year he would get them in a room and he knew where the bodies were buried and he'd come out, you know, all happy and still in power. And here we are some eight years later and, and more or less we're in the same kind of spot even though his, his window has narrowed. We're, we're at the beginning of the end of this. We're not at the end of it, not in my view by a long shot, and if they can undermine the MDC, if they can somehow break apart this, this uh, so-called power sharing, uh, we just have to see before I could say to the, my friends in the Congress or to U.S. taxpayers that now's the time to start giving direct uh, budget assistance to Zimbabwe. And what would you like to see the, this administration do? Uh, are there any changes in U.S. policy towards Zimbabwe that you think are needed at this particular point? Well, I mean, you know, uh, President Obama has put an excellent team in place with you know, Secretary Clinton and um, Ambassador Rice up at the um, U.N. who I have much admiration for. And, and uh, I, I think here, here we have an American president, I've said this on several occasions, an American president, a true son of Africa, uh, who is now le leader, um, you know, even with all our economic problems and we'll hopefully get over here one of these days, we are still the leader uh, of the world. And he, I think, uh, you know, he's got a lot on his plate, but I think Africa is there. And he, uh, along with, um, you know, Odinga in Kenya, the prime minister who's spoken out, the Botswanans, I mean, a number of them who've spoken out, I think, can, can join hands and work together. Um, we want to support the elements of reform within this government to get it to a better day because for anybody in this room who's been to Zimbabwe, it is, it is just a magical place and, you know, wonderful people and just deserves a much better government than it has. Do you have policy? Well, you know, two, two underlying goals that, that I, I know the administration is, is um, trying to figure out exactly how you tactically um, make these uh, happen, but one is um, transition is still needed in in Zimbabwe, and what is it a transition to? It's a transition to an election. I mean, it, it, at some point there has to be a, a free and fair election that is actually counted, um, and the sooner that happens, the better off that country is going to be. So, kind of one of those broad, overarching goals is um, let's use all the influence we can to get them to a place to, to have a proper election that is properly recognized. I think that's it's, it's one of their overarching goals. The other is how do you mitigate this, this underlying fear, and that's really what it is, this underlying fear of um, assisting this government of national unity financially, politically, every other way, to see the rug get pulled out from under you and one day wake up and, and the announcement is made that Mugabe has fired all of the cabinet ministers from the MDC and opposition groups and has replaced them with his own people. And meantime, your wire transfer just went, you know, three, three months ago through USAID for, you know, a big slug of something. So, um, you know, push towards elections, mitigate against seeing U.S. taxpayer money be taken by Mugabe. Well, and I think that to, to the credit uh, of, of those on the ground now, they are starting the process read. They, the, as we've, we've been reading about, the, um, there is a body that's been appointed by the parliament to begin to plan for a new constitution, to write a new constitution that would be, this was announced here just in the last week or so in Harare, and there's some controversy around, uh, and, and those of us who were there in 2000 when the National uh, Constitutional NCA um, was working on a constitution and Zano PF again, Mugabe, trying to ram through his stuff, um, lost his first election in February of 2000, which uh, he, he put up a constitution uh, giving him even more powers than he had. Um, he lost an election, the first one he'd ever lost. He came on to ZBC uh, ashen-faced. I'd never seen a man so sullen looking and uh, but he immediately rallied and that started the farm invasions and the beatings and the killings that went on in, um, in the spring and summer of 2000 but now they have um, the, the beginnings 
Uh, they've announced that they're going to write a constitution, and, and I would concur with what Walters just said, that that should get an up or down vote. Uh, there's a controversy about whether that's going to be done by parliament or civil society, I think, would like it to be done outside. And, uh, and that that should lead to elections, I would think, no later than, you know, the, the late, well, it should, it should be done sometime before the end of 2010 would be my view. There ought to be another set of elections so that we have a real legitimate government because, you know, it was clear that Chang'erai um, was elected uh, last year in the elections. To take a worst case scenario, we're talking about Mugabe firing the cabinet, but what other possibilities are there? Could someone take over from Mugabe and do a similar kind of thing? Oh, there could be a you know, coup d'etat of some type. I mean, we, we, we would um, run scenarios when I was there um, and, and, and encourage, and I think rightly so, or, or I should say discourage Morgan from putting thousands and thousands of demonstrators out into the streets. I mean, if you recall in 2000, that's when Milosevic went down in Belgrade and the pictures were riveting in Harare, um, the, the scenes of taking over the parliament and people, you know, it really became the people's government in Serbia and, and that had an impact in Zimbabwe, but we had said to them, listen, if you, if you march on State House and Zimbabwe House in large numbers, his, you know, 2,500 paratroopers that protect him that are kept next door, they'll come out and shoot and kill their own people. And so, um, you know, would, would one of this group uh, or, or several of them, um, we all know um, General Majura, you know, Joyce's husband, uh, known as Rex Majura, and whether he and others like Menengagwa would lead um, some kind of group, Chewinga, uh, because they, they don't want to give up the, the power and the privileges they have. Any, any of that's possible. I did note the New York Times reported recently that they are asking about amnesty and, and, uh, and Mutasa, I was surprised to see him even quoted on that question to a reporter in Zimbabwe. And, uh, but, you know, l let us hope for a better day for Zimbabwe. But, but, but Mugabe, uh, I'd almost make a football analogy. It's, it's, you know, Bill Belichick on the sidelines and, you know, he's got a playbook and he's going to run play number four again because he thinks it works and he'll, he'll run that until he's about ready to go off the cliff and then he'll steer the car toward the middle again. I mean, I saw this over and over again and he, um, uh, you know, so somehow th there needs to be a bridge to somewhere else and to get him out. We get the Constitution, we get an election Walter's talking about. Um, but I, I, I certainly wouldn't rule out, um, you know, a, uh, a, a less uh, optimum outcome and I, and I would put nothing, you know, pa past those individuals that are, that are under personal sanctions and their families. I, I think they're desperate people and desperate people do desperate things. All right, we're ready to take questions from all of you out there. Um, I think you know the rules. Wait for a microphone to speak. State your, uh, stand up, state your name and affiliation if you have one, and keep your questions. Questions and keep them concise, please. All right, we'll take one right back here. Uh, uh, Bill Lucy with the uh, American Federation of State County and there's some employees. What, what, uh, the elections are coming up in South Africa, what potential do they hold for a better transition in uh, Zimbabwe? I think that's a, that's a great question mm -hmm. and, and, and one that um, our policymakers in Washington are, are clearly already engaged in. Um, is Zuma going to take the same approach to Zimbabwe as Thabo and Becky? And I think the answer is probably no. And, you know, how big a difference and how uh, will Zuma um, approach this is still a little bit murky and hadn't been elected yet um, and so we got to give it a little space but but I would be surprised if the State Department weren't already in serious engagement um, with the South African uh, potential South African foreign policy type leaders about Zimbabwe and and they should be I mean it's it is uh, one of the key issues that we had real problems with Thabo and Becky on. Um, and from a purely bilateral relationship between U.S. and South Africa, this is a great opportunity to, to look at this in, in a new, fresh light. Um, and 
from a regional point of view, uh, South Africa has to be wanting to, to get this thing behind them. Um, and I think Zuma will approach it that way. So I think it's actually promising, good news. And part of the ANC coalition, the trade union part specific, specifically, has been very critical of Mbeki's approach. And Zuma, of course, depends a lot on that support. Exactly. So, well, let, let me just add to just a quick, quick addition here that when uh, uh, Zuma, uh, Jacob Zuma, was here in Washington and and hosted by the council, which is such a great um, forum, and and to Kay King and everybody, congrats on your your new facility here. But uh, when Zuma was here recently, he just as an aside, a very small point, but I thought symbolic, perhaps, of what he would. A different tact, as Walter is saying, he was very unhappy with Mugabe and his government that, that, that at the time they did not give Shangarai his passport so that he could go to a SADC negotiating meeting in, in Swaziland. And he got up and his wonderful accent and said, you know, how, how can this be? How can you expect negotiations to go on in good faith and the leader of the opposition, you don't allow him to travel? So um, Zuma is, a, is, I think, con will be confident. Uh, a different person um, into into our questioner, the, the labor movement certainly in, in as you know, Shangarai came out of the labor movement and and they deserve a lot of credit as to that country's evolution. So I saw a hand back there. <laughs> uh, Princeton Lyman, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, what would it take for uh, moving those people in your list of rogues gallery uh, to move out of government? What, what has to be offered to them? What, what's realistic uh, to, to get them to say, okay, we're going to step aside, whether there's an election or, or other basis, because they're not going to just walk away. No, very good question. Not an easy uh, question to answer, Ambassador Lyman. Um, th these are very, very tough people um, who have, you know, kind of milked the thing for, you know, decades now. Uh, they... Um, uh, well, uh, I would defer to the to the um, leadership of the MDC and to the Zimbabwean people to decide their fate. Uh, you know, we know we know of their bad acts, and I would leave it leave it in their hands. But I but I think the question about um, some kind of soft landing for these people to leave, um, I, I think, probably needs to be on the table. But that. That has to be uh, that has to be part of, uh, um, I think, the discussions by the 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 MDC, by by the government there, by the people, and I think they need to decide how how these people are going to be dealt with, um, and and I'm sure within the MDC there's a split as to whether, you know, certain people are dealt with more harshly than others, or whether. You, you get them out of the way and, and, and move on. But, but clearly, uh, as, as I know it, and, and um, from what I was told after the first round of elections, I mean, Mugabe, I think, uh, may have been you know, re relatively close to throwing in the towel, and, and a number of these individuals that are referred to here were the ones to say, no, no, uh, old man, you can't do that. We're not going to let you do that. You know, we, we're in this too with you. Uh, we're, in, in effect, the co-conspirators, and, you know, we're, we're staying put. We're not going anywhere. So they have to be addressed before we get to a better place, and probably some incentives would need to be offered. But I, I would leave those kinds of tough calls to, to, to the Zimbabweans themselves and their, and their you know, properly elected leaders. Want to add? A great question, though, Princeton. I mean, it is it is an issue that that the Zimbabweans are going to have to to grapple with, and and probably the regional leaders are going to have to 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 weigh in and make some suggestions too. Historically, you know, when we've seen um, authoritarians leave, uh, be it Charles Taylor in Liberia or whatever, and every every one of these situations is is different and has its own unique um, setting, but but generally, when when the guy the, the top man goes, it, it does crumble, uh, and it, it usually crumbles pretty quickly. Right, right. I mean, the the, the last thing I'd say there is, uh, I think there there was some view that when this cholera outbreak 
came up here in the last year, and over 4,000 have died, and we can never forget that, T totally need needlessly died, that, that uh, I think people who hadn't even really focused on how outrageous this had become said, wait a minute, uh, this is just beyond the pale, and, and who is responsible for this? So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a book on these people, and, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of public record. Von Tarikian from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Do you see a situation or scenario where this begins to have a really big impact on the regional stability, much more so than being sort of inside the borders of Zimbabwe? And, and in some respects, it already has had an impact on the region. Um, you know, how can we measure it in, in you know, GNP per capita terms for you know, the, the SATIC region? Kind of hard, but, but clearly the the demise of a, of a country that was um, as wealthy as Zimbabwe and as a big a, a food exporter and, and manufactured good exporter too um, has, has had a, a significant economic impact and, and that's just kind of purely you know taking out um, what Zimbabwe used to put into the region. You add on to that what it's actually costing the South Africans in terms of um, immigration um, and refugees, and that's really what we're almost talking about here, is a, is a refugee situation. Um, there are almost as many Zimbabweans living outside of Zimbabwe that live in Zimbabwe, uh, between those in Botswana, South Africa, and elsewhere. Um, I mean, it is it has clearly had an, uh, an impact on the region, and will and will continue until until those people feel, in fact, it is safe and, and worthwhile to go back home. Hey. Uh, Hank Cohen of SICE Faculty. Good to see you, Wolf. See you, um, I think we've been talking a lot about how we can arrange the demise of the Mugabe and his uh, apparatus. Could we do some brainstorming on how to build up Changarai? For example, could the U.S. government I mean, just throwing out some ideas, invite him on an official visit, uh, negotiate a, an aid agreement with him, and pass all sorts of humanitarian aid through him, and let him maybe and his labor union be in charge of the distribution. Uh, isn't that something to that'd be worthwhile following? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, take a shot at that first. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, Secretary Cohen, I think th those are all very good points. Uh, you know, um, th those of us in the room, and I mean, a number of us have worked in, and supported Morgan over the years. Um, the, the question of can you separate him out from the bad guys and, and make sure the money is spent properly, but, but I think a... Uh, Symbolically, having him come here under the right circumstances to see the president, you know, it so sounds like uh, something that certainly ought not to be dismissed out of hand and ought to be given some serious thought. And 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 I, I can't believe that um, you know President Obama and the Secretary of State and so forth are not um, and his advisors giving those things some thought. How you would, as a practical matter, get money in that um, doesn't somehow get polluted with the others is a, is a taller order. But the symbolism of having the, uh, the Prime Minister of, of Zimbabwe, uh, who we think is a pretty good guy, come here and be met by the President, and that we make certain assurances and pledges to him to help, I think could be quite profound. And I think he'd probably want to couple that with outreach, and I know our our Dear friend uh, Johnny Carson's been designated to be Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, and he'll do a terrific job, my predecessor in Harare. But there'd have to be, I think, contemporaneous, um, you know, on-the-ground consultation so that African leaders, particularly within SADC, were, were really amplifying what Obama and his people were doing. But, but um, Mr. Cohen, those are, those are very good points. Great. Okay. Take one right here. You. Yes, you. <laughs> My name is Vince Castatole, and I'm from Zimbabwe. Hold the mic up a little closer, please. My name is Vince Castatole, and I'm from Zimbabwe. My question is, uh, what uh, are you doing as um, Americans 
to give pressure to the Sadak people to isolate Mugabe um, so that he feels he has nobody to lean to, like the way he's doing now, because nobody's really speaking with one voice to isolate him. And that's what I would love to see. Yeah, we've been talking about Sadak, uh, but, but we haven't talked in detail what, what role should, what greater role should Sadek play, play and what role can the United States play in encouraging that? And, and I think what, uh, Tom, I think you referred to a little bit, uh, you know, behind closed doors, I think those Sadek leaders get together. We should say Sadek is the Southern African uh, countries. In case development of, community, yeah. right. Is it, I, you know, my guess is behind closed doors they all get together and those heads of state and heads of government and look at each other and say, can you believe this guy's still there? Um, you know, oh, and yet, in public, they are, they're, they're very diplomatic um, uh, for a whole host of, of, of protocol reasons, historical reasons, and others. Um, I think that, that the outside world looks to SADC and South Africa in particular to be the lead on, on you know, fixing this problem. Um, and Becky used to often say, African solutions for African problems. And um, we, uh, we, the Western world, have kind of said, yeah, um, that's probably right. But to your point, you know, maybe there should be some more um, direct levers used saying, well, we think that's right now. <laughs> you know, can you get on with it kind of thing. But it's, a, but it's, it's an interesting dynamic that, that goes on in, in, in the region. Um, the one uh, I agree with all that. The one thing I would add is that I, I've noticed in places like Zambia, civil society has has come out and spoken out very strongly that that Mugabe's got to go, and and the, the, particularly this cholera outbreak and all the deaths and I don't know eighty or ninety thousand made ill from it uh, r really hit a, hit a nerve, and uh, and so average Africans are standing up and saying to their leaders, enough is enough. You know, and, and in, in the South Africa context, you recall there was that um, famous ship, you know, floating around uh, the Durban Harbor that the unions, Kasatu, uh, the labor movement in South Africa, would not offload with, with arms to Z going to Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it quickly turned around, and the Chinese, I think, um, to their credit, recognized the embarrassment, and that ship was recalled. And, and went, you know, refueled and went back home. The last thing they needed were more um, AK-47s, RPGs, and enough ammunition to, you know, kill half the people in the country or something. So. Now back, back to you. Uh, my name is Yuri Sigov, uh, Business People Magazine. I want to ask you about the countries that support Mugabe. There are so many. Uh, international sanctions imposed by the West, by European Union, by United States, but still there are many countries that support Mugabe and support him militarily and economically. What kind of countries are these? And especially I want to ask you about the role of China, because China becomes the major economic supporter and military supporter. Do you want to take it? Um, and and, and I, I know nothing more about it than what I read in the paper with everybody else, but uh, it does seem that that um, China is interested in Zimbabwe for a host of reasons, not the least being their natural resources. Um, and uh, I, I don't know any specifics, but my guess is that they are looking very carefully at all sorts of Zimbabwe um, commodity and commodity-based assets. Uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, the thing I would add to that is you make a good point, although, uh, you know, um, and, and I guess I would echo, uh, echo Walter's comment. I mean, I have no particular inside information here, but my, my sense is the Chinese are very astute, and I think, I think they, they know a loser when they see one finally, and I think, I think they are. I mean, there was this whole fanfare in Zimbabwe about looking east, and, you know, they had the few Zim Air f planes that could actually get off the mm -hmm. ground, you know, going to Beijing, Harare to Beijing uh, via Dubai and about five passengers, and that didn't last very long, uh, and uh, you know, no, no, nobody seemed to want to buy Mugabe's tickets, but, uh, 
but the, so I think the Chinese, who are very involved in Africa, um, I think are trying to, to distance themselves from Mugabe. And I think that they feel that this is just a lose-lose. And so I, um, now, uh, there was this resolution um, so we, that was vetoed, uh, so we, we need to keep all this in perspective. But I, I, I well, there are, um, there are fireside sales going on there now uh, in, in, the, in the minerals area. And, uh, and I'm sure Chinese interests are, are involved as they would be involved in other places commercially. But I, I think at a political level, um, I don't think you're going to see too many more state visits for you know, Comrade Mugabe in Beijing. Tammy Holtman from AllAfrica.com. Um, Holtman from Where do either of you or both of you see a new generation of leadership developing? Is it inside the country, inside the MDC, outside, in the diaspora, among NGOs? Where are the people who are going to be the future leaders of Zimbabwe, and how, how much have, have their prospects been curbed by what they've been going through? Great question. Yeah. And I think all of the above that yeah. you named, I think it is going to be, it's going to be people from within ZANU-PF that will rise to the occasion and, and um, uh, will be embarrassed by what has happened and will want to, want to serve their country and, and, and come around and make it right. I mean, it's, you know, the Simba Maconis and, and all sorts of different people within within the the, the society that are e either there or have fl have fled too. Tremendous amount of um, uh, firepower, brain power in um, uh, in Zimbabweans now living in South Africa. I mean, you look at uh, key financial institutions in South Africa in Johannesburg today, um, and you know there's always. Uh, at the very top, some very, very smart, hardworking Zimbabweans. Um, so, would they would they return to their country? Absolutely, I think they. I think many of them would. So, I think it's going to come from civil society. It's going to come from those that stayed. It's going to come from those that left. Um, and it'll be it'll be a great homecoming when it happens. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that fully. That there's a, a a very talented diaspora. A number of them had been run out of there starting during the time I was there because they were a threat and. They were concerned about, uh, you know, being uh, potentially prosecuted. You know, uh, trumped up charges. Uh, there's, a, you know, they're, they're, you know, you know, Mugabe and his people are, are the Justice Ministry are great for cranking out totally, you know, bogus charges and all sorts of things. So people would kind of, run, you know, run to the airport, get on a plane, and then fax the resignation, you know, from a hotel in South Africa, saying they were no longer serving in Zimbabwe. They had gone, um, but they will come back. And, uh, and, and, you know, these are extremely talented people. Over here, uh, front row here. How are you doing? My name is Travis Atkins. I'm with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. Had two quick questions for you guys. Uh, following on Ambassador Lyman's question, when we speak of men like Mugabe, men like Bashir, uh, in a rogue gallery kind of way, my question is, um, what happens in the vacuum after they go? Because I think that we sometimes don't talk about the fact that the men who are around them or under them are oftentimes much worse than they are. Uh, and the second part of my question is, um, what other interest would the U.S. have in Zimbabwe other than uh, regional stability that may be less obvious for us? Um. Well, uh, you know, that's a very good question. I, I, I think Walter hit on some of it before. When, when, when the thing finally crashes, I think it could crash pretty quickly, and these people will uh, scurry about uh, as, as the you know, New York Times piece on the front page, I think it was a, a week ago today actually, spoke about these people wanting amnesty and talking openly about it, and you know, they, they, can, they can see the, the end coming perhaps. And so... It, it may be less of an issue, and, and, and believe me, I'm sure they stash money in various places and uh, are not going to be in well, walking in bread lines anywhere, I wouldn't think. But, uh, but they have to be dealt with in some way, and I would defer to the people you know, in, in, um, you know, in, in Zimbabwe. And, and, you know, but, but that 
you, you're, you're absolutely right. You, you know, there's there's the, there's the bad guy at the at the helm, Mugabe, but there's certainly this whole cast of characters around him that are that in some regards are worse. And just on, on alternative interests, you know, I I think you've really identified it. It is it is a it's an, a U.S. foreign policy interest to have a stable Zimbabwe for for Southern Africa. Gentlemen, I just have a, sh uh, um, a two-part question. My name is Lou Evans with Theorius Technologies. Um, first part of the question is: It seems to me, if you l if you look at Zimbabwe, what kind of technologies? Excuse me. I'm sorry. It's a DRS Technologies. It's a defense technology company. So oh, okay. Excuse uh, me. Okay, thank you. The, 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 the first part of the question is: It seems to me, if you look at at, at South, well, no, excuse me, if you look at Zimbabwe, at Southern Africa, and then you look at Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, there's obviously uh, it's, I'm stating the obvious when I say there's a history of a failed democracy, um, and and. And tyranny, essentially, in, in quite a lot of these countries. Not all of them. There's been some success stories like Botswana and some other ones. Um, but it seems to me that part of the problem may be when you look back at the history and the culture of the people, although you have, pe although you have a peace-loving people, um, very often what seems to happen is, is there isn't a culture of, ch of challenging authority, checks and balances, and it takes time for something like this to develop, obviously. Um, what, what f first part of the question is, what role do you think, if you agree with what I'm saying, what role that... Uh, uh, does a culture of, the, of this part of the, of the world play in, 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 the, in, 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 the, in the pattern of failed democracies and tyranny? First part of the question. And the second part of the question is, what can the United States do to change this, this pattern in a, in a strategic level, operational and tactical level? And then the final part of the question is, how important is our coordination with China in, a, in approaching this problem? And, 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 and obviously that's quite complex. And, what can we do to achieve that successfully? So. You want to take the culture first? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I guess I would disagree with the questioner. Um, I, I think the um, – I learned a lot about humility, civility, um, kindness in my tour of duty there, um, the, the absolute decency of the people. And I remember when uh, Simba McConey came and had breakfast with me in one morning, our um, cook, Monica, who's a beloved person, passed away, I mean, just, just anecdotally, I mean, we had f five people working for us in the ambassador's residence, you know, four, four of them are now dead because of AIDS and <laughs> other problems, which is, you know, just a symbol of, you know, the deteriorating country. But she said to me, that, that ought to be our president, Mr. Ambassador. And so I, I, would, I would argue to the contrary of what you're saying. And in fact, we've had good transitions in Mozambique, several transitions, I think, Namibia is a bit of a mixed bag. I have done some things there, and they are probably halfway past the Salmon Yoma period and still have a ways to go. Botswana is, is obviously a, a strong example, and, and Zambia, uh, I think, has come along. So I, I think um, when Mugabe goes, uh, the, the, uh, you, you will see uh, a number of very good options and, and, uh, and in fact, a, liber a real liberation of the people. Uh, and so they, they, uh, they are sophisticated enough, in my view, to pick better leaders, you know, once this authoritarian tyrant is gone. And Walter, about U.S.-China, uh, you did some work in that area when you were in office. And, and do I you think see this as, as a place of Strategic cooperation, oh, I, you know, I think we should. I, I think that uh, that it is it is in our best interests to be talking to and, and attempting at least to figure out what China's motivations are mm -hmm. um, on these issues, um, and then in fact attempt to, to, to guide and direct and, 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 and bring them into achieving the, the foreign policy goals that we want. I think the China. Uh, interests in a place like Zimbabwe, as Tom, you Im implied, are a moving target. I think they're kind of realizing, ooh, this maybe is, is not going to last very much longer. And so I think it's a moving target. On just a quick um, antidote on the, on, the, on the cultural, um, you know, this notion of Zimbabweans being denied their democratic rights, and yet they they want those rights. I mean, you look at the voter turnout in every mm. election. Um, it's incredible, the lines. Uh, I'll never forget in 2002 when Mugabe stole yet another election, um, <laughs> there, was, there was this wonderful photograph of this, um, this elderly woman um, helping her, 
her husband who, who could not walk um, to vote. And the way they got there was a wheelbarrow. And she literally was going to take him to exercise his democratic right, even if it meant um, you know, a wheelbarrow ride for two, two miles down a bumpy road. So I think there is a culture very much of, of um, we want this, we just, we just need um, to, be, um, to have it be just and, and, and right. All right. It's part of my uh, job to bring this to conclusion at the right time, so, uh, and also to remind you that this has been on the record. We can take one more short question and a couple of uh, concise answers. So this, <laughs> I saw a bunch of hands. All right, we'll go second row there. You've had your hand up a long time. Hi, my name is Dennis Chen. I'm with Catholic Relief Services. We're one of the operational NGOs that through our network is still very active doing food aid and such. Um, assuming you're, you're the best case in Zimbabwe right now. Yes. Assuming the best case scenario and the political cloud lifts, what do you see as the set of um, the most effective set of development interventions that could bridge the gap from humanitarian relief towards um, economic growth and long-term development? As you probably know, the U.S. actually has quite an active um, interest and presence in the region, with the MCC being actively engaged in Mozambique, Namibia, Lesotho, and Zambia. So. Curious to see what you'd see as the U.S. Uh, I'd point to microenterprise. I, I would say that uh, besides sort of the big picture stuff, you know, there were 60 American companies when I arrived there in 97. There are very few there now. You know, get them to come back, get the Europeans to come back. But this microenterprise thing, particularly for women, I think could be very powerful. Is there any of that happening now? Um, historically, there had been. I mean, the tuck shops, the people along the way, um, um, you know, loans of as little as 250 U.S. dollars being turned into a business. I mean, it, it, these are remarkable stories. When the time is right. Yeah, when the time is right. Agriculture has got to be uh, uh, absolutely at the top. I mean, this is, a, this is an agri agriculturally based economy um, that has gone through all sorts of, of, of huge radical transformations. Um, and it is, a, it is a complex political, social, cultural situation. But at the bottom of it is the economic powerhouse for the country, and that's farming. And that, that's got to be wrestled with. How, how serious was the, is the devastation? You watched, you watched a lot of it uh, take place in, in the uh, farming, in the agricultural sector. Right, right. I mean, it's significant. It was starting when I was there, and, and I mean, I've made some subsequent trips after my tour. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we all wanted land reform. Um, some of us in the room were involved in it in '98 and offered offered money, and uh, but to do it the right way, there was an injustice. Land had been taken from from the black Zimbabweans uh, wrongfully, illegally, but Mugabe then just gave it to his cronies. People had no idea how to farm, and it's been a complete disaster throwing you know, tens of thousands of people out of work. Um, but, uh, but yes, there are enormous farms that are laying fallow. Um, but as Walter pointed out, I mean, it's, it's a huge, uh, I mean, you know, Zimbabwe literally could feed Africa if, it, if, it, if the agriculture sector was run properly. And you, 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 you know, you could go to those farms with the irrigation, the high tech they were using, and they would, you know, it would be any, as good as anything here in the United States in our, in our heartland. Okay. Well, that's a good note to end on. Thank you both for your participation. Thank you. My audience. pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.